we had rules and laws to protect animals before we had them to protect children. It's like an epidemic, an epidemic, an epidemic. Everybody keeps saying it, but nobody's doing anything about it. Child abuse and neglect in New Mexico, unfortunately, has been that redheaded stepchild we don't talk about. It's there, it happens, and as long as it's not my kid or my grandchild, it's like, why do I need to know? We've estimated that for the most expensive type of abuse and neglect case, those cases on average cost about $107,000 to taxpayers alone. That doesn't include the negative occurrence on kids' lives over time. They're not going to succeed in school. They're not going to have healthy relationships. They're not going to be physically or mentally healthy. It's going to be a tremendous cost to us. There's a significant body of research called Adverse Childhood Experience Studies, which began in San Diego at Kaiser Permanente. So he queries 17,000 men and women, and he asks them about 10 different adverse childhood experiences. Were you beaten as a child? Were you sexually abused as a child? Were you neglected as a child? Did you witness violence between your caretakers? And if you simply fit into even one of those 10 categories, you were more likely to suffer from hundreds of medical and mental health conditions, including things we would never think of being correlated with child abuse, such as cancer, heart disease, liver disease, etc. So name the social ill. You want to reduce smoking? 95% of all smokers have an A score of at least uh, one. I oversee a program where we conduct forensic interviews of children who are alleging physical abuse, sexual abuse, or may have been witness to a violent crime. Annually, we do approximately 1,200 forensic interviews here at this site a year. I have to go to the nurse's office every single day before At or home, after my hands were all blistered and red, and my grandma asked Nobody me. Nobody ever happened. believed me, you know, because they were so nice and loving. Ten years ago, our average used to be 50 interviews a month. Our average now is between 85 to 95 interviews a month. We've applied good treatment to cancer, we've applied good treatment to diabetes, to any other risk to our health. But child abuse continues to be invisible until somebody is hurt, until a child is a statistic. And that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable anymore. This should be your number one priority because whatever else you care about, whatever social L you care about, you want to reduce juvenile delinquency, you want to reduce crime, you want to reduce drug usage, you want to reduce alcohol usage, you want to reduce poverty. We know from a very significant body of research that child abuse feeds into every social ill. So name the social ill you care about. If you really care about it, if you really want to get a handle on it, you have to reduce child maltreatment. We could save millions uh, of children and literally hundreds of billions of dollars. I find it really difficult to imagine what it's like for some of the families that I care for who face a number of social stressors in their day-to-day -day life, including poverty, social isolation, geographic isolation, drug and alcohol abuse, mental health problems, the whole gamut again of social ills that face our community. And the bottom line is that when our families are struggling, our kids are going to struggle. It's common sense and we have to recognize the connections there and really learn that we have to support families in order to support kids. And one of my sisters, she's having her second I have two baby. brothers and sisters. I was born premature with cocaine in my system. We see these 20-year-old females repeatedly coming in with a pregnancy test and who have drug addiction, who have alcohol addiction and trying to get them to talk about what would help them, what would help them to not become pregnant. Talking to them about drug addiction and alcohol addiction, our visits in a public health office can be pretty lengthy. We have the time to talk to um, every one of our clients individually. We talk about uh, a reproductive life plan. What do you want in your life? We want people to be ready before they have a child. That can be emotionally ready, financially ready social supports, just to plan when they want to have a child.
sometimes despite the fact that your baby's been fed, they're well rested, their diaper is changed, they're gonna have an off day, they're going to be fussy, and no matter what you do, they won't be consoled. <laughs> Parents become frustrated, they then lose control and sometimes shake the infant. And for some individuals who have actually repetitively caused these types of injuries, what they will say is, this is the only thing that worked. This is what quieted the baby. Maybe not recognizing at the time the reason the baby quieted was because their brain was injured. What we found out is that almost 70% of our parents had never heard of it before. When you give parents education on prevention of shaken baby, you give them like a vaccine or an immunization so they know what not to do. This is a baby that is a simulator and we take it to health fairs to show the public, depending on how hard it's shaken and the area of the brain that lights up, will tell you how impaired this child is. Look in the back and you'll notice now that the baby is now visually impaired or blind. Now the sides are also lit and at this point there's memory loss and emotional loss. There's learning disabilities and behavioral disorders happening. And one more shake. And now the baby has lost the ability to speak or hear, and the probability of death is high. We educate them about what shaken baby is, how to prevent it, how to cope with crying, how to put the baby down, make sure the baby's safe, and walk away. Call for help, listen to music, distract yourself, and then come back and check on the baby. But don't pick the baby up because you're so frustrated. And our intention is to take this out to not only all the units at the University of New Mexico hospitals, as well as take it out to the other hospitals, take it out to the state. The research we've seen indicates that when parents are educated on how to prevent shaken baby, the incidence is decreased by 50% or more. And it will save our healthcare system millions of dollars, plus it'll save all that suffering, not only for the children, but for the parents. We're the second regional child protection training center in the nation. There's now five, and we're trying to work on two levels. One is to train future professionals who are going to be working with children, future social workers, teachers, um, help them to understand more about child abuse, to recognize the signs and symptoms, to know uh, how to report, to know what the law is. And then the second part is to train the current professionals uh, and provide them really hands-on experiential training that will give them the skills to investigate, prosecute, do forensic interviews with children, and hopefully, of course, to treat and prevent child abuse. One of the things we do at the uh, training center here at New Mexico State University is to teach professionals how to process a crime scene. So this is a mock crime scene set up uh, based on a set of actual uh, fact uh, patterns. And so we instruct folks, uh, everything should be paid attention to, everything should be processed uh, beginning on the exterior of the house. It may be as simple as violent drawings uh, by a child. You should always have uh, your antennae up. This is our crime scene. We're walking through it as an officer, maybe. I had come up and asked her for food, that I was hungry. And from there, she told me it's rude to interrupt. So she hit me with a beer bottle. The beauty of this is, whatever errors you make, this is a safe place to make them, because whatever errors you make in this scenario, nobody's actually going to die. If you dissect where that parent had come from prior to that crisis where a child is very severely maltreated, all the signs are there. Poverty, previous maltreatment, substance abuse, lack of extended family and support, all of those things are usually very apparent in advance. And so the home visitation program really helps identify those things before they become a crisis and before a child is abused or neglected. There are some parents who are nervous about every last little thing and they don't know what's normal. You need license to have an animal or a car. We don't need 
licenses to have kids, so there's no training that occurs before you have this child. Many of these families were not taught how to parent, and so they're doing what they saw done in their own homes when they were children. So you do what you know, and when you know better, you do better. How are you? Good. Good. The baby still asleep? Yeah. The home visitor shows up regularly to provide support and encouragement, to listen to the joys and the fears of childhood, to be there when a new parent is concerned about something. I also brought you your The role of the home visitor is to support the family, so the family can then support the child. There's some um, tomatoes. No, they're chicken tomatoes. And your favorite one? Oh, yeah, we eat those a lot. <laughs> I know you like those a lot. She's been coming since I was four months pregnant. I got to monitor what I was supposed to weigh Seven. instead of waiting to my prenatal visits. Yeah. <laughs> it's voluntary. No one is mandated to have to do this program. There's a whole list of options that we go over. And then the client can kind of choose maybe something that's important to her. And it might be something about how to discipline my child. It might actually even be how do I take better care of myself? How do I get myself into school? Well, I passed my chemistry exam with a B plus. Oh, that's really good. So I was like, yes. That's really good. Yeah. You have to take care of someone. You have to take care of yourself. If our cups are empty, then how can you give from your cup to somebody else if it's empty? You can't. When was the last time you guys went on a date? I think it, it's, it's good for us too because it, it makes us think about like what we should be doing together to get more um, like connected as a couple, I guess you could say. When families participate in home visiting, you're going to get a 48% reduction in child abuse because a relationship is built there. That home visitor comes once a week for three years, starting in prenatal. 11, 9. Oh my goodness. <laughs> She's big. Well, regardless if a program is privately funded or state funded, they save the state tons of money. The more you spend on the playpen, the more you save at the state pen. Currently in the state, home visiting providers are reimbursed at $3,000 per family per year. That's 10% of what it costs to incarcerate a child at YDDC for a year. Studies have shown that for every dollar invested in early childhood services, we'll receive a return of seven to ten dollars. All too often, I think what we're hearing is, we're a poor state, we can't afford those resources. I think we're being penny wise and pound foolish, um, that if we really do believe that our children are our future, that we're to invest in our children and that they're the most valuable resource we have for our future well-being, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Spend it now or spend it later. You're going to spend it. All of these children are all of our children. This is our society and if we're not going to take care of children in general and look at each and every one of them as our responsibility, then we have only ourselves to blame. It's 100% preventable. We know what to do, we just have to have the will to do it. They saw the bruises. They saw the bruises. And they just didn't want to say anything. They just didn't want to say anything.